Hello, hello, fellow punks. It's me, June, L- local man, uh, noted punk, uh, general, uh, 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 fake academic. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about counterintelligence against punk. The years 1979 to 2021. Now, I whew, was uh, uh, really biting off more than I could chew with that one. So, what we're going to talk about today is essentially um, kind of an overview, uh, starting with what the deep state is, uh, what its goals are, uh, how uh, it threatens uh, punk music, punk as sort of this chemical X factor that ex- uh, exists around leftist circles and will always kind of sprout there. Uh, a couple key moments in the history of you know uh, espionage and attacks against uh, uh, punk and leftist circles uh, and wider culture by uh, deep state movements. And then um, we're going to finish up with a, a couple useful tips and tricks for um, how to spot an arc in your leftist circle. So hopefully this uh, makes sense. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. So. Let's start out with some definitions. So what what exactly is the deep state, right? We can define it essentially as organized crime for the elite. That's really what deep state's goals tend to be, right? And it exi- the deep state as a concept exists in pretty much every uh, uh, major government in the world, right? It's the idea that there is a, a mostly secretive uh, abiding power or power structure within government that is obscured from uh, the people, their their sight, but also their you know uh, inclusion at all. They have no power over it, and the deep state sort of uh, does whatever it has to, right, to accomplish its goals. Uh, now, in in history, there's been many you know uh, sort of iconic, the big players of the deep state, right. We can talk about the CIA, the FBI, Interpol, uh, Turkey's uh, deep state organizations in their connection to Gladio, right. Um, when we're talking about you know, bigger sort of like more notable points where the deep state became very apparent as uh, uh, an operating power within the world. We can think of things like MK Ultra, right? Uh, the McGill mind control experiments, Charles Manson, uh, which actually just as of recent um, new journalism uh, has uh, come out that I think uh, very reasonably connects Charles Manson as an MK Ultra side project, essentially, that whole family. Um, very interesting book about it. Um, then we can think of things like, you know, uh, the FBI killing uh, leftist figures, whether it's Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, um, you know, uh, various climate activists. Uh, essentially, uh, what we can see the deep state's goals to be is. Uh, making sure that leftism and general anti-authoritarianism or you can even say just pro-democratic movements within countries remained controlled but on a wider scale the deep state is also interested in culture right um so we we can see violence we can see uh very direct action against left groups and their ideas but we can also see more indirect action against wider cultural figures right and just the idea of of being a leftist and being a punk specifically so why does punk specifically threaten the deep state right it's because punk is specifically anti-authoritarianism anti-authoritarian or historically has been right it's opposed to you uh it's not opposed to using violence uh, to attain political goals and further on it actually has political goals right so many of these cultural movements before punk and after didn't have the same sort of cohesive if uh you know not always actually attainable or even collectivized political goals and even if sometimes that's just fuck cops you know fuck the government that's enough to threaten power structures when there are large amounts of people who do that. And uh, I think more than anything, too, uh, it's always been uh, that deep states and greater power structures are threatened by youth movements, right? Specifically leftist youth movements. And that's always what punk has been, right? So we can see throughout time that punk has understood society as inherently material and thus malleable, right? It often has concise political views that can be 
you know, disseminated to a, a susceptible public. So that threatens dominant ideologies. It actually asks something of the government and it, you know, we're willing to get a little crazy about it. And that's always been uh, hugely threatening to um, not only uh, l functional power structures such as like cops, mayors, what have you, you know, teachers, you know, the, the, the people in, in our society who actually um, not only uh, enforce ideology, but actually create it within us. It's not only threatening to them, but it's also threatening to uh, everyone else because it uh, it says by by encouraging some people to believe that these power structures are maybe malleable or even made up, it throws all of it into question, right? So some punk efforts that were going on uh, globally just in the early 80s but have continued throughout right you can see punks uh supporting fighting the housing crisis anti-oppressive tactics anti-imperialist tactics like the committee in solidarity with the people of el salvador that was going on in the 80s during the contra war there was a ton of different stuff during the 80s that we were going to talk a little about pro-nuclear disarmament and the great peace march that was also going on uh during the Contra time, uh, pro-gender equality slash reproductive rights, pro-wealth redistribution, often labeled communist or anarchistic, which of course became a watchword and a, a scare word um, in America, especially as the years went on. But we can see that, you know, punks have been traditionally linked with uh, not only, um, you know, the more sort of like uh, ambiguous, ambiguous, um, like anti-oppressive sort of movements and anti-oppressive feelings, ideologies, but also with direct action and um, more sort of like globally, uh, uh, globally like powerful uh, movements against, you know, uh, actual shittiness in the world. So when punk starts, right, in 1979, it, it, already uh you can also say it started way earlier than that but for our purposes of our arguments 1979 it it was uh frightening mostly uh for its if not uh cohesive ideology it was frightening for its its lack of anything but nihilism right that it seemed to just be these teenagers uh young people uh who were f violent who were angry and who didn't want to participate in the world the way everyone else did but as we get into the 80s and punk becomes more of uh, an actual abiding presence in culture, it's not just like um, a phase for young people to uh, uh, freak out during. It's, it's becoming an actual lifestyle that people form their identities around. We see deep states and uh, wider, you know, cultural figures and also, you know, just like government officials actually take it seriously as something that needs to be taken care of, right? So in the 80s, we can talk about East Germany first, right? Uh, there's a fantastic book called Burning Down the House, um, which is sort of a, a, a his history of early punk in East Germany. Um, reading from it now. The punks frequent comparisons of the communist authoritarianism they grappled with to the Nazi authoritarianism of an early generation particularly aggravated the Stasi, who saw the number of East Germans who were receptive to punk as a worrying faction within their tightly controlled society. It's through the presence of the police, and especially the Stasi, who arrested and detained various punks, coerced musicians to inform on their bandmates, and killed one band member's dog, that the sharpest resonances with contemporary DIY scenes come into focus. Reading Moore's account of the Stasi's pervasive presence in all aspects of society, compiling dossiers on musicians and venues and doing all that they could to shut them down, it's hard not to think of a certain contemporary analog. And that's very true. Um, so as mentioned here, the Stasi were extremely afraid of uh, growing interest in punk movements in East Germany, right? And for good reason. Um, it was East German youth were uh, revolting to the fact that they saw their grandparents as Nazis and Nazi collaborators who had been let off the hook, right? Their parents and their grandparents refused to talk about these things, refused to talk about the horrors that had gone down only, you know, 40 years ago, only a generation back. Um, 
and they were revolting against it. What they saw in government was those same government officials, those same Nazis now just put back in power, right? Which was very true of the time. Uh, the U.S. really just rejiggered uh, the entire system of the Nazi bureaucracy and Third Reich into what became modern day Germany. That That's largely true. And uh, East Germany specifically, or East and West Germany specifically. Uh, but for that reason, um, you can see very real uh, active attacks against um, punks of the time, whether it was raids on shows, uh, compiling dossiers on uh, bands uh, and individuals that book shows or went frequent in shows. There are uh, fantastic uh, mugshot photos, <laughs> collections of mugshot photos of uh, uh, cops who were literally just rounding up people in raids and, and taking mugshots for these like large dossiers. So pretty much every punk in, in local scenes, but also in wider like city scenes in Germany, in East Germany especially, were uh, fully um, documented and surveilled at the time. Um, as mentioned, cops even killed someone's dog. They had bandmates inform on each other. I mean, it was uh, a concerted effort. Ooh, my cats are fighting, sorry. Hold on a second. Ooh. Ooh, anyway. So it was a concerted effort, physical violence against punk movements in order to, to stop this. And over uh, across the pond, um, at the same time during the 80s, Reagan had come to power, right? So at this point, we have not only a physical war against uh, punk movements, but also the beginning of a media war. So this is the beginning of, of the moral war against punk subcultures, right? which not only attacked punk, but attacked wider leftism and humanism and culture as a whole, right? Uh, there's a great quote here. Sure, his acting was third rate, but decades of film experience gave him, being Reagan, an understanding of how fanfare and spectacle can blur the lines between commerce, politics, morality, and repression. So a moral panic against punk and culture, right? parents encouraged to disabuse their kids of any punk notions and it actually served to turn punk away from ideological sources and toward cosmetics honestly uh, it equated it to a fashion movement over a political movement and effectively neutering its more serious political implications in a youth society of a youth society and rebellion in the larger culture but you had all kinds of incredible, you know, media fanfare surrounding the, the concern of punk, whether it's like Phil Donahue bringing, you know, uh, mortified parents and their punk y y youngsters onto his talk show to like talk about like the the degeneracy of youth while these, you know, poor kids just said like, it's just a fashion statement, you know, forced into these corners to uh, neuter themselves and sanitize themselves of the more serious notions of punk that maybe society is fucked. Maybe society is wrong in the way that we, we value the world and the way that we, we interact with each other. And though you can't always see sort of those more serious uh, uh, political ideologies in these young people, right? A lot of them are just kids. The idea is there that maybe society could be different, and that's dangerous enough, right? We can't have the youth or anyone thinking that everything isn't exactly the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> Reading from Wire here. It wasn't uncommon to see these and other struggles featured on flyers for fundraiser shows or supported in the pages of zines. It was also common to see the tactics of some of these movements, in particular the anti-nuke movement, derided as too passive, too hemmed in by liberal respectability, or sometimes just too boring. Various initiatives emerged out of the punk scene pushing for more direct action or more youth involvement through projects like Rock Against Reagan, morphing out of Rock Against Racism, War Chess Tours, or Better Youth Organization. For all its dislike of hippies, punk was a receptacle for radical politics and utopian experiments the same way the former counterculture had been in the 1960s. Yes, the co-optation of peace and love had been sent, had been cemented <coughs> excuse me, by the time of Reagan. Calls to mellow out in the face of Armageddon were rightly skewered throughout punk. But as Matson writes, plenty of punk's elders had been involved in the militant activism of the 1960s too. Tim Yohannan, a.k.a. Tim Yo, for example, participated in the infamous struggles around People's Park in Berkeley. 
He would go on to co-found both the Gilman Street venue in Oakland and Maximum Rock and Roll, one of America's punks, American punk's most important publications. Punk, therefore, should be viewed in the same light as Dada, Surrealism, Situationism, and other serious cultural movements. These movements didn't just limit their criticisms to the art world or culture industry. At their height, they opposed all aspects of a pointless order, rejecting hard boundaries between art and life, politics, economics, economics or culture. Political activity and artistic creation, they, are, they also often allied themselves with various strains of anarchism or socialism. If Reagan was aestheticizing politics, then it was the job of punks to politicize aesthetics. To Matson and others, punk already pointed in this direction. Dispensing with the dichotomy b between rock star performer and passive audience was a matter of preserving a democratic culture. The barter of zines and cassettes wasn't just because kids were broke. It mirrored the ethics of potlatch and circumvented the re record industry. Putting on a show in a squad or abandoned warehouse was often a conscious attempt at reimagining urban space for something other than commerce. As for the music itself, its confrontational sound wasn't just about provocation, but also pushing people out of passivity and into changing history, right? So that was the real fear re regarding punk, right? That it was not passive. So we can see uh, not only Reagan's uh, media attacks on, um, uh, on punk as uh, direct actions uh, uh, against uh, punk movements, but also uh, more psyop, which are psy uh, psychological operations against them, including folks like Serena Dank, uh, a noted uh, CIA and deep state uh, involved person who during the 80s started a group called the Parents of Punkers Group. Right, which sought to depunk wayward youth. Uh, Serena uh, went around America uh, addressing crowds, making money, and being supported by the deep state in order to uh, uh, encourage uh, a movement by parents to essentially uh, anti uh, or like depunk, remove their kids from the punk scene. Though we never mentioned the name. Uh, reading again from that same wire piece, though he never mentioned the scene by name during his presidency, the ideologies and political projects that came to embody his philosophy hated punk. It is clear, and we're not here to entertain, that Reagan's agenda shared an affinity with figures like Serena Dank, who painted punk as a scene of violence and moral degeneracy. There's also the matter of state repression, as in the case of police departments that raided punk shows and shut down venues, most consistently and notoriously in Los Angeles. In at least one case, the FBI threatened the publishers of a zine with criminal charges if they did not shut down. These attitudes carried into the culture industry itself during the 1980s. The arguments of Dank's anti-punk crusade are reflected in ridiculous films like Class of 1984. That film in turn complements Red Dawn's longing for a patriotic youth loyal, loyally defending God, country, and private property. Art as commodity informed the needs of Cold War nationalism and vice versa. This logic extended into the music business. As Matson recounts, record labels experienced their own crisis of over-reproduction in the 1970s. Only the advent of MTV, which dramatically changed the way we conceived of music, turned this crisis around. The possibilities of cross-branding, of deepened commodification, were endless. Reagan himself participated, most notably when he invited Michael Jackson to the White House, just as Pepsi was releasing its commercials featuring the iconic pop star. So this is where we get out of the 80s and into the 90s, right, with the in invent of MTV. Now, I believe this is really where things start to get dark unfortunately, because uh, through the 80s, I think it was, and you know, I'm, I'm no expert, I'm just some guy, uh, but I believe that it was maybe its lack of cohesion and its general nihilism that seemed to drive punk to uh, be anti-authoritarian and unable to unify, right, uh, which caused... Um, it to last a little bit longer in terms of its political impact, right? But once uh, punk started to unify around money, uh, specifically around bands being able to sell and make uh, uh, marketable music, we begin to see uh, the vultures come out, but also um, folks find out where they can make their life within this, right? Where, and and as soon as um, punk became like a class maintenance structure punk became a, a, a another way for you to you know buy a house and raise your kids um 
it became much more difficult to maintain uh, uh, an active radicalism within it. So now we get into the 90s, right? So we've got MTV, uh, Nirvana, early grunge, and then the entire advent of the concept of selling out, right? It wasn't a viable option before it was never just, on, it was never really on the table for most bands because bands weren't marketable in this scene essentially before grunge. And then by the mid 90s, we get the entire concept of punk being dead, right? Um, but in that same face, we have new advents of like entire new waves of punk music, but we're moving away from bands such as like, from a more collectivist, ideological uh, minded punk style, like Minor Threat, Fugazi, Minutemen, et cetera, towards bands that are more introspective um, and furthermore, more functional as classic bands what we've now come to understand is what a band is right bands like rancid afi fucking uh face to face like um a million different like new uh subcultures sort of emerge out of punk but also blend within punk to sort of push the old things aside but also rebirth certain aspects of the more glamorous early uh british punks just like the clash Ramones, etc that uh, could now be marketable to a new post Nirvana, post like, you know, all of the 80s uh, uh, American and global markets, right? So punk now becomes not only a watchword, but an actual uh, um, means of survival, right? Uh, uh, more than survival, a means of, of, of achievement. Like you can, you can be jawbreaker now you can be uh nirvana or a million other bands you can be rancid or fucking afi you know and that really wasn't on the table beforehand so within that you see a lot more splintering ideologically right where we uh functionally no longer are a uh a uh, a, a rabid youth organization, right? We're not on uh, the 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 entire punk movement is no longer on the FBI's most wanted list, essentially, because it's it's now just like any other subculture. It's a place where people go to make their uh, to make their mark, to be seen and see others. But the idea of like you know um, social upheaval is pretty low on the list for the average you know punk by 95 because you have you're starting to have some level of an actual um investment in the society around you right we're all getting older so you all you see uh the fbi other deep state organizations move away from prosecuting punks the way that they were uh in the 80s and and beforehand so heavily and move on to actually um, <laughs> going about the uh, the daily work of destroying left movements. So this is uh, where you start seeing, I mean, obviously the drug war gets ramped up. Uh, uh, the Clinton, um, Bill Clinton famously uh, being uh, the person who began incarcerating black people at uh, uh, for petty drug crimes at the rate that we now do. Um, uh, began that process. I mean, the eighties really got it going, but, but Clinton really, uh, dug his heels in for all of that. Um, and furthermore, we also see the FBI prosecuting climate activists. This is a really big, uh, aspect of the, t of the nineties, um, is how many, uh, very real, uh, uh, attacks against larger climate activist circles, uh, occurred during this period, right? We largely don't think about this, uh, this, time period of uh, organized crime against leftist circles, um, things like the FBI uh, uh, falsely accusing um, and imprisoning uh, a vegan activists of the time. Um, you've got the, uh, I believe it was, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the information in front of me, very foolish. I believe it was the uh, Atlanta bombing uh, where uh, they the FBI uh, falsely accused some vegans of like bombing, bombing like a, a small um, poultry center, like factory. Uh, of course, that didn't happen, uh, but they were imprisoned otherwise. Um, and we also see essentially um, the cohesion of a cultural idea of punk being sort of neutered, 
right? Punk is dead. That's where that's where the term comes from. But now we get 9-11, right? Beforehand, we had, uh, you know, sort of, um, we had Limp Biscuit ramping up to things, right? We had uh, uh, all these sort of calls for um, an angry introspection, um, uh, whether it's like the screamo movements, the emo movements, the hardcore movements of people who were angry for really not any good reason. I mean, they, they, there were material reasons, but they couldn't recognize them, right? Not in the way that punk did, where you could look around at the world and say that it was wrong. Um, now we were looking at ourselves and saying we were wrong. And then 9-11. So post 9-11, what we have is a totally different world, essentially, right, where we get the Patriot Act uh, and just global sort of like cohesion around this idea of like, OK, we're going to partner with uh, uh, corporate surveillance and uh, uh, deep state surveillance in order to um, do espionage at like a wider scale because um, we need to be collecting everything all the time just so that we can parse through it later. So that's where we get uh, deals with like Google and other large data corporations to allow the NSA, Interpol, other um, major deep state organizations to archive and compile data as they see fit. Eventually, you know, years on, we get the Snowden revelations that um, phones, I mean, like pretty much every aspect of our technological society uh, run straight to, you know, these data centers in Utah and are pretty much at the at the beck and call of of NASA, NSA and other uh, deep state authorities. But furthermore, we also get more sort of FBI direct participation against punk and punk movements. But what we're looking at more is not what punk was, right? We're talking about things like FSU. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Friends Stand United or Fuck Shit Up it was a Boston-based, uh, originally anti-oppressive um, punk gang, you could say, uh, hardcore collective, uh, initially that set out to rid... Uh, punk spaces in the 80s and 90s in Boston of white nationalism. So they were famous for uh, using violent means to uh, attack uh, and um, uh, disband uh, white nationalism and Nazi chapters within Boston. But then eventually uh, FSU as a, as a concept became chapterized, right? So other people across uh, the country and across the world eventually um, would be starting up their own FSU chapters in their cities to do the same, using violent means to uh, rid their scenes of what they determined eventually to be uh, shitty behavior, you can say. Eventually, however, FSU, under the uh, direction of its leader, Elgin James, eventually became nothing more than a, a morality bait, a supposedly moral gang. Um, they ran drugs, uh, were involved in prostitution, um, various other criminal acts, uh, were extremely violent, and were largely based uh, all over the states and um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Canada. Eventually, the FBI actually prosecuted Elgin James as the leader and broke up the FSU um, after uh, Elgin and other folks uh, used... Um, I, uh, they... <laughs> They, they threatened a band uh, and, and were uh, caught um, uh, extorting them for, for thousands of dollars uh, in order to uh, give them like safe passage on tour. But the FBI broke that down. Now, you can also see in the Philippines at the same time um, bands acting against the drug war and authoritarianism going on in that uh, country being uh, shut down by their... Uh, deep state powers um so you've got bands like uh like uh fell war or uh the crazy don't collective um who are being shut down constantly this is going on now continuing um by their government in order for staging any kind of anti-oppressive uh or anti-drug war uh sort of narratives in their wider culture you can also see 
the UK infiltrating their own leftist groups, whether it's Welsh uh, anti like anti NATO or nuclear disarmament groups. It's actually come out recently that um, multiple uh, police officers infiltrated leftist groups in the UK during the early aughts, um, going so far as to uh, uh, father children with multiple um, activists and organizers in these groups and uh, seeding uh, resentment and destruction within these groups. Uh, anti-NATO and nuclear disarmament groups, um, anti-racism groups, uh, general Marxist collectives. They were infiltrated by many undercovers who did horrible things to these people, pretended to be, uh, you know, leftists and went so far as to father kids and then abandon them um, uh, to literally just disappear from these people's lives because they were undercovers after several years. Um, there's uh, these trials are actually just going on now. Uh, ju they've just been beginning over the last six, six or seven months um, and will continue for the next few years. Actually, it's going to take several years to get through all of it. But all is that to say is that post 9-11, we can see that um, not only has uh, have attacks against leftist movements increased, but uh, they've become more uh, sinister in the way that they actually function. Uh, there's more attacks against culture, there's more attacks against uh, actual individual people's lives, more psychological operations, similar to the ones that we saw against counterculture movements in the 60s, uh, whether it was you know uh, infiltrations of, of Black Panther groups or hippie groups, et cetera. But we can also see uh, a wider network of ability under the uh, Patriot Act and various like new technologies that simply didn't exist at the time. I mean, at the time, everyone wasn't carrying, uh, you know, a, a data collector in their pocket every single place that they went. So it was much harder to uh, control a population. So what's the future for us, the future of punk politics? You know, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, political circumstances becoming more dire, I think, will necessitate more need for violent catharsis in art circles, but in wider culture as well. Politics will become more of a constant in our daily material lives. My cats will continue to fight each other, um, uh, even when I'm home. I can't stop them. And just more than anything, as uh, politics becomes more of a, a, a material uh, reality in our daily lives, um, it will become more apparent, like more uh, of, of frightening political ideologies will become more apparent. And fri by frightening, I mean to the establishment, right? So you'll you can be sh certain for one thing that the deep state and other uh, abiding authorities will never be willing to give up their power. And as uh, they become more worried, you should become more worried because they will attack you. They will uh, do whatever they can to stop dissent amongst the masses. That's for a fact. So how do we keep cops out of our lives? How do we keep uh, narcs out of our circles, right? You know, uh, unfortunately, there's no uh, there's no fast and easy rule for discerning a psychological operation because for that reason, they're based on gaslighting lies and you're not supposed to uh, uh, you're not supposed to discern them. Right. But unfortunately, you have to be discerning about these things. Um, narcs exist. They exist in leftist circles. They exist in almost every aspect of our lives, um, whether it's actual police operators <clears throat> or just people who don't share your political views, unfortunately. So it's important to make sure that you are discerning and that you uh, operate yourself to the letter of the law, especially when you're operating in ways that you know don't are, are anti-oppressive or specifically uh, anti-imperial. Anti if you're using uh, violent tactics, make sure that it's only with people that you know very well. Um, things like secret shows, secret groups, um, long, tr uh, if, if you ever notice people who, uh, seem to take long trips, come in and out of, no out of your life, out of nowhere, friendships that, uh, want to, uh, become immediately very close and then, uh, just seem to instigate things. Uh, so 
people who instigate like violent action who seem to come out of nowhere and be like hey we should do crimes you know that might be a cop but again i don't want to go too much into these things because i don't want to encourage anyone to go on any witch hunts in their own lives for uh, police operators but unfortunately they are an aspect of our our real life so um all i can say is that more than anything now i think that uh psychological operations happen in culture um you can see uh your consent as an individual being manufactured constantly by things like media operators um general like uh whether it's teachers authority figures etc whether it's things like um you know the media trying to encourage us that joe biden is like a totally reasonable human being or that uh you know um trump was the uh most dangerous uh president of all time and uh an outlier amongst you know a group of obvious war criminals that all presidents are you know constantly we see our manufacture being con our consent being manufactured around us and i would uh be more discerning regarding that than anything else uh, is that more than anything cops will try to infiltrate your shows cops will try to infiltrate your groups they'll try to instigate you to uh, do crimes and then be caught doing them they'll try to frame you for doing crimes that you have never done they'll try to uh, uh, push your family away from you or otherwise um, so dissent within your own life whether it's sending Martin Luther King's wife uh, uh, blackmailed videotapes of him cheating on her or sending him letters encouraging him to kill himself whether it's raiding Fred Hampton's house and killing him in his bed with his wife because his wife was a narc, you know, something like that. These are all very real tactics, but more than anything now, I think what works to the benefit of governments is our general sense of hopelessness and manufactured consent regarding that, that nothing could ever change and that more than anything, punk is dead, right? That punk died in 1995 and that the ideas surrounding it of a cohesive, ideological movement against uh, a general and greater authority is impossible but the fact is is that it's not it's not impossible collectivism is never impossible and a collective ideology surrounding the material reality of our daily lives is the most likely ideology to emerge that's why punk was useful and that's why it can be useful again so with that, I think I'll leave it there. Um, this is a pre-recorded video, uh, but hopefully I am in the chat. Um, so feel free to shoot me a message. Love you all. Thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye.